joining us starting momentarily. All right, um, well, thank you all so much. I think we can go ahead and start. Um, thank you for joining us today on International Human Rights Day. My name is Priyanka Bhatt and I'm the senior staff attorney at Project South. We're a 35 year old social justice organization based here in Atlanta, rooted in the black radical tradition. We aim to protect and defend all immigrants and communities of color, um, and including Black, Brown, Muslim, Middle Eastern, South Asian communities through movement building and movement lawyering. I'll be moderating today's webinar with our amazing panelists today. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to go ahead and take a moment to talk about why this conversation we're having today is so important. Um, as you all already know, our communities have been on the front lines combating all different types of attacks from attacks on reproductive justice and our own bodies, um, from police brutality to voter suppression and the criminalization of black, brown, indigenous, immigrant communities and more. At Project South, we've been fighting to abolish ICE, detention centers and prisons all together as an abolitionist organization. For the last decade, we've worked with detained immigrants to lift up their concerns and their voices. We've written many reports on the human rights abuses happening in immigrant detention centers We've supported direct actions. We've done congressional advocacy, local advocacy, and even international advocacy. In fact, in the last year, we had a hearing on the abuses happening inside immigrant detention centers right here in Georgia at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. In addition, we've engaged in several class action lawsuits to hold private prison companies and ICE accountable for their violations and abuses. At Stewart Detention Center, we're part of an ongoing lawsuit challenging forced labor practices happening where detained immigrants are forced to work for as little as a dollar a day. And at Irwin County Detention Center, we filed a groundbreaking federal complaint with our partners at the Georgia Latino Alliance for Human Rights, Georgia Detention Watch, and the South Georgia Immigrant Support Network that broke the news of horrifying abuses happening at Irwin County Detention Center, including invasive gynecological procedures occurring on immigrant women without proper consent or knowledge. In addition to all of our years of advocacy to shut down Irwin, We've also been part of a class action lawsuit on behalf of the women who have suffered medical abuse while at Irwin. And while we welcome the news of the ICE contract being eliminated at Irwin, we know that that is not enough. We know that Irwin County Detention Center is still open right now and are all the rest of the immigrant detention centers across the country with the same abuses happening there as well. So with so much at stake in our communities on the front lines, it is so important 
to talk about resistance and organizing to protect our communities. And that is why it is such an honor to introduce our incredible panelists today who are doing just that. We're joined by the incredible Adelina Nichols, the director of the Georgia Latino Alliance for Human Rights. Adelina has spent decades fighting back against state suppression and working to end detention pipelines like the 287G program that trap immigrants into ICE custody through engagement with local law enforcement. We've also seen incredible organizing from directly impacted communities. It is so great to be able to introduce Uche Chukwa Anwa, the co-director of the Queer Detainee Empowerment Project. Uche has a history of not only organizing to help his own immigration case, but also to help many others. Uche was part of the Atlanta Mayor's Commission that helped end the ICE contract at the Atlanta jail. And he has been working nonstop to help release detained immigrants in the tri-state area of North. And lastly, with the Shutdown Irwin campaign, we have seen how important it is for our movements to be intersectional, tying in the immigrants' rights movement to reproductive justice and broader movements against gender violence. And so it's so wonderful to introduce Isha Pundit, a reproductive justice activist and the co-founder of the Center for Advancing Innovative Policy. Again, I am so honored and humbled to be in conversation with you all today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I'll be asking our panelists a series of questions and then we'll have opportunity at the end to shift into audience Q&A. So my first question to our wonderful panelists is to introduce yourself and the work you do. How did you get involved in this work and what motivates you to continue? Um, you each have about five minutes and we'll go ahead and start with Isha. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Isha. I live in Houston, Texas. I am uh, really honored to be in this conversation with you all. And um, okay, the work that I do. So I um, am a, an immigrant from India to the United States. I moved with my family to Queens when I was three, Queens, New York, and now I live in Texas. Those are my two home nodes, <laughs> New York and Texas and Houston, where I am now. Um, I have been working inside of the reproductive justice movement, as well as the movement to end gender-based violence um, for many years now. And I think, um, Priyanka, your question was like, what keeps you going and how did you get here? Um, that's a good question and a really hard one. I think um, the, the older that I get, the more I think that um, the root of social justice work is really like sort of trying to figure out um, our own personal and family histories with trauma and violence. And so I think a lot about borders. I think my family is one um, that has been impacted by borders um, for generations, uh, most specifically um, the border between India and Pakistan. I, my family was directly sort of split by that border. And so that's something that we have all been negotiating um, and then I've been doing reproductive justice work um, for, you know, since the early 2000s. And I started doing that work right as the first, um, as George W. Bush became president. And so um, I remember immediately as a young activist being in sort of like opposition to, so I don't really have an experience of um, doing reproductive justice work when it wasn't sort of oppositional to systems of power. So that's kind of been my shape, uh, the shape of my work. These days I do policy advocacy work with grassroots organizations and support small grassroots organizations in building policy agendas. And that's an unconventional job for someone who has radical politics because people think that 
policy work is where radical ideas go to die and where we compromise away our values and our vision. Um, and I just think there's a lot of ground to be lost if we're not engaging in those arenas. And I believe in you know, left flank policy. Uh, and these days I've been doing a lot of work on access to healthcare, uh, reproductive justice, um, criminal legal system reform and other racial justice issues. So I'll stop there for now and uh, pass it to whoever's next. Thank you so much for that. Um, why don't we go to Uche and then Adelina. All right. Hi everyone, sorry, I'm using my phone to speak. <laughs> Uh, my name is Uche and I use he, him pronouns. I am um, originally from Nigeria and I identify as um, black and gay. Um, I currently work with the Queer Detainee Empowerment Project, which is an uh, immigrant rights based organization in, in New York City that provides services and support to LGBTQI plus gender non-conforming and HIV positive immigrants that are currently in ICE um, custody or those that have been released or at risk of being detained or being deported. So we help them in securing structural health and wellness, educational support, emotional and legal support. We also organize um, around um, the structural barriers and state violence that would uh, otherwise prevent our folks from um, living a fulfilling life. And we also um, believe in not just creating a narrative of thriving, but also surviving. Um, so my, uh, how I got involved uh, in organizing space was actually um, some years ago, I don't know how, how, how long now, but I was 15 years old when I lost my childhood friend uh, in Nigeria because, um, he was uh, he was raped by uh, four men who uh, who targeted him because of his uh, effeminate nature um, and um, wanted to just punish him for just you know being him. A few months after he was raped, he tested HIV positive, and um, as a result of that, um, he committed suicide. So that was the time that uh, in my life I felt like. There, there has been a shift. There has been like, uh, it's, something needs to happen. And I was really angry and upset for losing my friend in that way uh, that I wanted to demand justice for that. But at the same time, I wanted to also um, stay safe because I felt that these people know me and uh, they might be coming for me as well. So I started doing some research at that uh, early age um, and you know, found out about um, some organizations in Nigeria that was uh, providing services and advocating for LGBTQ people in Nigeria. And I got involved with them, started volunteering with them and finally got um, hired to another organization uh, that also doing same work for uh, the LGBT community. I started working uh, for the community, advocating for LGBTQ rights in Nigeria and also doing um, HIV prevention work uh, for the community. And then in 2014, a law was signed by the former president that criminalizes the LGBTQ people and poses 14 years prison terms to anyone who is part of this community and 10 years prison ban to anyone who supports this community or even organization that support the community. That means that if you are my family or friend, you have to report me to the law. If you fail to report me and the law finds out that you are aware of my sexuality, you will go to jail for 10 years for not reporting me. And then me being gay, I will go to jail for 14 years. So with that law, people, you know, people started taking laws into their hands. LGBTQ people started be, uh, getting missing. People were being killed. I've lost countless of my friends because of uh, this homophobic law. And for the fact that I work for the community, for this community, uh, it became even harder for me to like, you know, live or exist in the country. I was getting threatening messages and calls. I was, um, 
beaten up publicly several times, uh, put up naked to the extent of my family finding out about my sexuality and uh, my dad just saying that he doesn't want to, you know, me to be part of his family. Uh, so a lot of issues were happening. I lost my family. I lost my community. Um, so at that time, I felt like this is the time for me to leave the country because it's either I stay here and die or I leave for my safety. And that's how I, um, I came into the United States to seek for um, safety and protection. But then I got, uh, I was met at the airport when I arrived into the country by the US immigration system and uh, customs. And I was taken into uh, ICE custody where I spent three months in um, Atlanta City Detention Center. So while in detention, I started advocating for my release. I started organizing uh, for my release and also for other folks who were uh, you know, incarcerated at that time. Um, I started telling my story from in, from detention, even reached out to um, Congressman John Lewis, who uh, advocated for my release. And that's also how I got to um, got in touch with Kevin and uh, Priyanka and some other folks in, uh, in Atlanta. And then when I got released, I stayed in touch. And then the mayor of Atlanta, um, uh, I was kind of, appointed to sit on the board that kind of um, advocated for the close closure of Atlanta City Detention Center. So that's how I've continued to um, to work in this, uh, to work around this um, system, because for me, I believe that uh, people don't have, people don't deserve to be caged. No one deserves to be in cage, especially for LGBTQ people. Uh, immigrants that are just, you know, fleeing and simply just want to be able to love whom they choose to love and live freely. Um, and that's, you know, also how I got involved with the organization that I'm currently working with and um, currently helping other immig LGBTQ immigrants like myself. And my motivation is really seeing our members that would have helped thriving and surviving and living their truths in this country. Uh, that really inspires and motivates me to keep fighting and keep um, advocating for more. One of our, our member that uh, we've, you know, worked with, helped her, uh, you know, when she got into to New York City uh, from detention center, you know, um, she, she joined our leadership pro development program for transgender women. And the cisgender queer women graduated from that program. Currently, she's doing amazing work. She's one of like you know uh, amazing organizers in the United States. She's currently leading a leadership development program for trans women in her community. She's also uh you know in school now, going to be a paralegal. So it's like just seeing all those success story really like motivate me and keeps me going and want to do more. Thank you. Thank you so much for your powerful words. Um, we'll now go to Adelina. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Priyanka, um, for allowing us to be here and be considered participating with those, these two amazing um, community members as well. Um, as Priyanka mentioned, uh, my name is Adelina Nichols. I'm the executive director of the Georgia Latin Alliance for Human Rights. And I start working in that community a long time ago. Um, I'm top, I, I, am, I am an immigrant myself. I am from Mexico City. And part of the motivation to get involved is this, that you need to go out on the streets and look out exactly what is going on with your community. Um, at that time, when we start to uh, do a reaching, um, a, there was a huge need and still is that for driver's license. And that uh, uh, allowed me to, uh, in, to travel, uh, to travel all over the state, uh, uh, looking around and asking the community members about their needs and uh, how they feel like isolated. Um, so we decided to continue tra to, uh, traveling around the states uh, promoting a campaign, a campaign for driver's license, and we were able to collect 50,000 signatures to request driver's license for undocumented community um, to the former governor here in the state of Georgia. 
And the more you walk and the more you learn and the more you want to help. And I think that first is uh, we have to be very clear where are we going? Uh, no, and who are who do you want to serve besides yourself? And I think it's important to understand that um, in order for in order for us or for all of us to do the work that we are doing and why we are doing. Um, and this uh, work that we start, I'm talking about uh, at the end of 1999. Uh, it's a long road now. Uh, it, and looking in community members, try to empower them as well to organize. Um, and that has been kind of the, the priority for this organization, like uh, the priorities that demands of the community, but also how we organize uh, all, uh, all this energy and you know willingness to, to step forward against detentions, deportations, arrests, racial profiling. And in that road, uh, we continue growing with the trust and support of our community. I think, I do think that GLAR, it is it's GLAR because of the support that communities around the state has offered through all these years. And these are, they are the ones that we, uh, we are doing this work. Uh, mostly uh, communities that continue being undocumented, un uh, unable to adjust the status we don't have driver's license and through the years we have been uh, facing that we have to be in the streets fight after fight after fight so part of um, the work and the motivation is uh, how many people is willing no, to to continue and i think this is growing uh, and part of my motivation my heart when i go to the streets is my could be my brother or my sister or my my mother, my father, um, the one that's been arrested by local law enforcement or uh, raided by ICE at some point in any kind of neighborhood around the state. And something that called our attention as well, uh, Priyanka, is the rural aspects of our the state, no? More isolated, communities with low income. So uh, we merge into that and as uh, trying to provide support and also was gaining the trust you know, that's very important for us that um, and that what's in many ways have opened the space and yeah, there is a recognition not only for GLAR, but for uh, individuals in the sense that in, in collective power always is going to be uh, better. And my motivation is there, no, is the, maybe eating tacos in a you know in a community meeting or you no know, someone bringing tamales or this is the motivation no the participation of our community this is exactly where i would like to continue uh a, a, with receiving as well thank you all so so much um as you all have heard we have an incredible amount of experience um with our panelists today and they are definitely personal heroes of mine. So I really, truly appreciate all of you being here. Um, so my second question is, as you've heard, um, each of you have an incredible amount of experience challenging large institutions. We've heard Uche from you that you've challenged homophobia head on, um, both in Nigeria and the US. You've successfully challenged ICE not only to advocate for your own release from immigrant detention, but now you're advocating for many others who are now detained in ICE detention centers in New York. Adelina, you went up against the most brutal anti-immigrant bill passed here in Georgia, HB 87, and you actually sued Governor Deal and got several provisions of the bill blocked. You also have um, decades long experience going up against and fighting back against ICE and local law enforcement. And Isha, you have been such an incredible advocate um, and have worked for um, decades challenging policies that harm our communities and have publicly called out different policies and uh, politicians, as well as the patriarchal and heteronormative systems of power. So my question is, what should organizers and activists anticipate 
when challenging large institutions? What were some of the challenges that were surprising? What were some of the lessons you took away in order to be successful? Um, and I'll go ahead and put that in the chat as well. But why don't we start with Adelina first? Absolutely, thank you, Priyanka. Well, I think that um, when we are challenging uh, large institutions, the first thing in mind is that this is not a short or small struggle. No, you have to be very clear that this is perhaps the long run uh, in a campaign that you are organizing. And you have to be very clear, you know, because sometimes I, uh, I hear that, uh, oh no, the communi communities need a, a, a win, no? And sometimes fighting these large institutions, what you face is a a man, maybe years, no, like against 287G or against Polish ICE, still fighting that. Um, but we have to be clear that while you don't achieve your goal, you have to grow into the inside. You know, you have to go inside your community and, and uh, kind of a, a underlining the reason that we are in the fight. It's like a, you have a double work, no? The, the work that you see on the streets and the work that you have to do and um, inform, and kind of empower, that would be the, the, the word, to empower inside your community because at the end, that's the power, no? The power is coming from community. Very clear, uh, who are you, whose priorities are, uh, where, uh, where are the, where your priorities are coming, you know? Uh, Perhaps I have another uh, uh, likes or priorities, but I think that as a community organizing organizer, we have to uh, 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 be very careful to listen and to obey the wishes of our community. You know, I think that's another concern there. And thinking that this some some struggles takes years, takes absolutely years. Uh, and what you need to be very clear, what are your goals, your priorities, but also not only by yourself, but also the work that goes inside, no? inside your community members to grow and to support all the struggle. Thank you, it's so powerful and so true. You have to keep looking at the long-term goal. Um, thank you for that, Adelina. Um, we'll now go to Isha and then Uche. Okay, um, I really appreciate what you just said, Adelina, about the kind of twin pieces of work, the internal work, the fortification and clarity that you need, and then the long-term systems work. Um, I think that this, the campaign to shut down Irwin kind of show, shows us something really important about what it takes, what happens when large institutions uh, like ICE or even like an individual detention center that's part of a web um, of the broader criminal legal system in the carceral state is that um, despite naming for decades, naming the violence that's happening in these places, the what it takes to shut down uh, one detention center in the broader web was, um, it took a whistleblower, it took the bravery of a whistleblower, it took an entire movement ready to support that whistleblower. Um, it took an entire sort of political and social scaffolding. I don't think it's an accident that um, Irwin being shut down happened in Georgia because you all have a very powerful grassroots ecosystem there that was able to hold that whistleblower story and transform it into a series of ad advocacy because of your grassroots power. Um, I think in addition to thinking about the long, the long road, which is true and a little, you know, uh, overwhelming to think about big systems, I often describe it like, you know, slowly turning a big ship or slowly sinking a big ship, depending on what metaphor speaks to you. Um, that it, there's a lot of, there takes a lot of time, but also that these institutions respond with violence and that we have to be prepared for what that will mean. We've seen 
in our national politics, in our in in a lot of southern politics, the backlash to victories. So I think um, we also have to remember that uh, when there are victories, there's often um, kind of responses that come to that. So that's important to be prepared for and to be sort of like grounded for. Um, as all social progress has resulted in a lot of backlash and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the impacts of that over and over again. And I think the other piece is um, the kind of individual, the power of the individual story and the power of the individual whistleblower, I think is also really important here that sometimes we all feel very small in the face of these very um, big systems, but that, uh, that we can't forget that um, those kinds of uh, interruptions in systems can actually have ripples. Um, and then of course, you know, like I said, there has to be sort of scaffolding to support that whistleblower and, and people need to build entities, you know, like the work that Uche is doing with other um, detainees and survivors, you know, like I feel like that it's sort of like uh, small seeds and then big supports. And I think if we are individuals who have a strong sense of justice and who want to fight and who want to march, the best thing we can do for ourselves for the long haul is to find ourselves a political home that will support us through the long journey, a place where you can learn about issues and where you can also um, like have a sense of depth of practice of social justice because um, naming the human rights violations is important, but it's never enough to bring down these big institutions. So we need to have kind of all of the supports in place. Um, and then I would also say celebrating the victories, whatever they are, is really vital um, because that is what keeps us all going is the, is the reminder. I mean, I think a lot about how the Trump years impacted all of us and how we have all, you know, like, at least for me, like the sort of sense of defeatism was really creeping in, you know, and so uh, psychologically, and, and I think, I think that um, the moments of celebration and remembering uh, our kind of collective strength is what can counter that kind of defeatism, because I think that their strategy is to have us feel as though it's inevitable, you know, um, that the violence is inevitable and the harm is inevitable. So I think resistance, a joy as resistance is part of that as well. Thank you so much, Isha. I think you're absolutely right that we need to be prepared for backlash, right? You mentioned that institutions respond with violence. And we actually saw that at Irwin, right? Where the women who, um, were interviewed as part of the complaint that we filed, they were uh, put in retaliation. Either they were put in solitary confinement, some of them were deported. And so um, that's definitely a real threat as well. Um, and Uche, we'll, we'll go to you. Uh, yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, uh, the panelists. I think that both of you have really touched on most of the points. Um, I just wanted to uh, touch on a little bit on uh, Isha, one of your points about uh, victory, celebrating victory. It is very important to celebrate victories, uh, but the other thing that about that that really gets me kind of angry and upset sometimes is that when these victories are won, you now start seeing different organizations that didn't even really participate in this fight, then trying to claim the victory. And I'm like, I have been here organizing, I've been here, you know, like killing myself, fighting, and now because maybe you are a larger organization, institution, you want to come and claim the victory. Sometimes, you know, it becomes very challenging. And then because these other groups are bigger than yours, uh, you, your organization or your group get buried under, uh, you know, don't get celebrated enough because not you, you are a smaller organization. Um, and then, um, about also, um, uh, I think it was Adley that talked about uh, knowing that sometimes it's not really just about like, you know, the victory is about you understanding that this fight is gonna be a long fight. 
uh most times people are just like you know envisioning the uh the goal okay we want to win this campaign we want to win this but not being patient enough to really put in the work uh that you know that is required for that victory to to happen and then also speaking um um speaking from personal experience and also from the experiences of the communities that we serve some of the challenges that we get to see is uh, as people as for me as a black person um as a black gay and also immigrant person is like i have to constantly fight to you know to be seen i have to constantly fight to be recognized for the work that i'm doing i have to always fight to be at the table you know because if you're not at the table you'll be on the menu um so we have to always you know uh, fight to be included in in most of the conversation because in even within the immigration uh, conversation the narratives most times are centered around the heteronormative lenses and the LGBTQ immigrants are most times excluded and erased in this immigration conversation forgetting that we are the ones that are most times uh, most disproportionately impacted by the system. For instance, transgender women in ice custodies are being, they are being misgendered, they're being uh, uh, tortured, they are forced to be, you know, to be kept in the male unit, um, which is also adding to their mental, psychological, uh, you know, health. Um, over the last two years, we lost three transgender women in ICE custody. Most of these conversations are not being talked about when we, when, when the general uh, mainstreams are talking about the immigration um, conversation. I, I don't hear people mention this trans, this trans, three transgender women that died in ICE custody. You know, but again, they are also being put in social confinement. Um, I remember when I was in detention, I was uh, isolated for two days because I was speaking out about my um, about myself. I was advocating for myself. I was isolated for two days. So these are the challenges also that we have to always recognize even when we are doing this work. We have to know that definitely there's going to be challenges that would come uh, that would come with 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 uh, with this work. Also, coalition building has its own challenges uh, because, you know, different groups that form the coalition, they all have their own uh, mission and vision of the, the organizations want. So when people are coming to a coalition, they're already coming with that mindset of, okay, I want to do this based on how my organization, you know, operate. But sometimes it really becomes like a challenge or a problem, like, you know, having the whole coalition come to a conclusion or to an agreement on what uh, folks want to do. Um, and then talk about uh, tokenization is also another thing that we have seen happen a lot within the immigrant community, especially within the, uh, the LGBTQI uh, immigrant community. Uh, most times LGBTQ people are being tokenized a lot. Um, so there's definitely a lot of challenges that comes with well, uh, that comes with with this. But I definitely also want to like you know um, uh, take it back again to speak on the uh, celebrating the victories. Um, sometimes you know even though the victory is very small, we just have to like you know stop and take a pause and celebrate the win and then continue fighting. And also, you know, taking a step back and, you know, resting, it is something that I am still learning how to step back and, you know, rest. Because sometimes like, you know, you get into the work and because you're passionate about it, you want to continue working, you want to continue working and you're forgetting to take care of yourself. So these are the things that, you know, we definitely need to, con you know, continue to, um, to put into consideration as we are doing this work. Because this work is very, very challenging and it can emotionally it can be very derailing. Because also, again, most times, especially when you are someone that is, you know, directly impacted by the issue that you are fighting. Uh, for me, as a, also a gay person and also asylum seeker, I'm still going through my asylum and then trying to also provide services and support for, um, for people like myself. It then becomes very challenging when I need those services and maybe no one is there to support me you know I, sometimes i do feel like you know 
I don't think I belong here, you know, because now I'm going through this myself and no one is here for me. So it's definitely, um, you know, very, very challenging the work that we do. Thank you, Uche, so much for speaking to your experience and definitely lifting up the burnout um, that a lot of organizers and advocates feel um, and definitely the erasure and the co-optation of our movements is a real thing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and continue. I want to go a little bit deeper and ask each of you questions specific to your own work. Um, so Ucha, you already talked a little bit about this, but going a little deeper, we've continued to see white supremacy show up in a variety of different ways, including violence against the LGBTQ community, the immigrant community, and the Black community, especially in the last year. We know that our movement work has to be intersectional, tying in immigration to LGBTQ issues to combating anti-Black racism. What has been your experience organizing around all these issues and tying them together? Have you seen any particular organizing inside detention centers that really speaks to the intersectionality? Um, <laughs> I feel like maybe I feel like I I spoke on this a lot uh, um, on my previous um, speech or comment, but I also um, I definitely uh, want to add that the the system is anti-black. Uh, we have seen in the last uh, months or years how black uh, immigrants have been targeted by the uh, by the immigration system uh, at the you know at the border. Uh, also within our own community, within the LGBTQ community, Black LGBTQ immigrants have been also targeted by, the, by even this current administration. We have seen a lot of detention and deportation of uh, Black uh, people, Black LGBTQ uh, immigrants specifically, uh, you know, within the context of the work that we do. That also is really tough. But I'm also even when I came into the country, what that this that was actually the first time that I experienced racism. I didn't know anything about racism back home in Nigeria because we're not being taught about race. Because you know, to us, everyone we're we're the same. Like we don't really like you know see black or white. But coming, so I didn't know about that. But until you know, until I got into this country, when I was being arrested by the immigration, uh, by uh, the CBP officers, and being taken to ICE, because um, from the airport, first I was chained, my legs, my hands were chained. I was shackled even to my waist, and also my nose and my mouth was covered. Um, and then when they took me to the detention, the uh, I think it was the nurse that ask them why did they cover my nose and my mouth. The comment that the, uh, the officer said, he's a white guy, he said, well, he is coming from Africa. He, he could be coming here with virus. He could be coming here with Ebola. He could be coming, he started mentioning different viruses. And to me, just hearing that, I felt like, so does that mean that because I'm from Africa, like I have some type of disease and virus that we know we are distributing in Africa and then I have to be discriminated because of my race and because of you know the place that I'm coming from so experiencing that for the first time really was an eye-opener for me and also it led me to understand well welcome to America this is the reality it's not just what we know back home that I, you know because we're being taught or being you know made to believe that America is the like is heaven you know, is is like when you get there, everything is is perfect. But it, it is not just how it you know appears in the picture. Um, recently, some of our members uh, and clients that identify as black have been detained and deported. Uh, recently, one of our members that has spent for over forty years of his life in this country was uh, was you know arrested by police. Uh, he served his terms in jail and then was transferred to immigration uh, when he was released. And after spending two years in high school study, he was deported back to Jamaica. This is someone that I've never been to Jamaica for over forty 
40 years, you can imagine the life that this person will be experiencing right now. And not just him, but also other, pe other persons also that have lived here over, over 20 years and is still currently in ICE, in ICE custody and going to, um, through his um, you know, deportation. And also one of our members who identifies as a black transgender woman uh, who was you know, spent over one year in ICE custody and uh, was released with nothing, ended up committing suicide early this year because of the trauma and torture that, and also the mental health impact of her being uh, you know, incarcerated by ICE. But most times, again, these conversations are not, you know, being covered in the mainstream media, uh, media because, you know, of course, our communities are very small. We are most marginalized. And most times we don't have the voice, uh, you know, we don't have the voice to really advocate for ourselves because we have a lot of things that we are still struggling with, struggling to really fit in, in a society that don't accept you, struggling to even find and build a community, create a family for yourself. It becomes really, really, uh, really hard and tough uh, for us to really, you know, live and survive in this community. And then the Biden administration is not doing anything to really change some of this, um, some of these uh, policies. You know, we've been organizing since Biden got into office. We've been calling him, calling his administration early this year around February due to the effort of our organizing. He made a promise in one of his uh, uh, speech. He, he said specifically that he is promising to protect LGBTQ refugees and asylum seekers. Till today, nothing has been done. There is no plan on how he wants to protect the community. Nothing has been done about that. So it's like the, the, they come in and they make promises, but they don't do anything. They still keep on targeting black uh, LGBTQ community, black migrants, and even in the black, um, black Lives Matter movement, most times the black migrants are even not being recognized. They're being also erased in those movements. Last year, a, a black um, Nigerian lady was murdered in uh, Florida, but this, story didn't really get like the attention compared to the other black folks that have been murdered for instance george floyd brianna taylor and the rest of them the, it was still the same way that this person died because she's a migrant her story didn't really get a lot of coverage in the media um i'm gonna stop here because the more i speak i get more passionate about this and um yeah thank you Priyanka. No, thank you, Uche, um, for bringing up anti-Black racism that is in our immigrants and criminal legal systems and the long-term mental health effect of being detained or incarcerated. Um, I want to move to Annalena next. GLAR is a powerhouse. We all know it. Um, you all have blown us away uh, by your successful campaigns from organizing in South Georgia for decades, to deportation defense, to ending two 287G contracts in Georgia. Um, more recently, through the 501c4, GLAR played a huge role in the 2020 elections where Georgia helped defeat Trump and helped Democrats win the Senate. So we've seen tangible results from GLAR's organizing around elections um, to remove the sheriffs in Gwinnett and Cobb counties. My question is, in what ways is organizing around elections part of a larger movement strategy to combat white supremacy and abolishing ICE? And in particular, how do you see the role of electoral politics in grassroots organizing and movement building? Oh my God. But I, I, I think that um, the electoral politics is, is one strategy of many others that we should use. No, I know there are organizations that are dedicated only to electoral politics, which is okay. But uh, the, the history and the need and the struggle have, um, have used other strategies as well that in many instances have provided us as well and feed us a lot of victories. The 
el, the electoral politics in the particular case of Georgia, I believe has two components. One is the demographic change uh, of the presence of Latinx here as well, the, uh, the history of the grassroots community organizing. I don't think we should put aside no, this work for almost 20 years at the grassroots level, because at the end is part of the movements are, if you allow me to say, are moved by the people. It's the people that create this energy. So we, ca we cannot and we should not disassociate the grassroots con movement building and part of the strategy for electoral politics. No doubt that uh, the electoral politics uh, kind of a, a, was a, another area for us to experience. This is really very new uh, field. It's a very new program. But uh, I, as I mentioned before, uh, Priyanka, uh, I think that grassroots is what powers no? all these changes that we have seen in particular in COP and in Gwinnett that the, for the first time, we do have two black sheriffs in the history of the county, you know, in both counties, that's unbelievable. And allow us uh, to be more kind of relaxed, you know, it's being always chased by the local law enforcement was an incredible resistance from our community. But I think that this is the work that we must continue. I don't say I will not, and I think that what allow us allow us in the past in 2020 to make these changes is the grassroots community organizing that has been um, a kind of the priorities and continue, even though challenging even uh, Priyanka. A, the traditional way to do politics, you know, in terms of okay, these electoral politics they are only looking for those that uh, are citizens. No, the others that are not citizens, I don't care. I don't, they don't count. No way, Jose. You know, um, I believe that you have to combine in different levels and different capacities this strength that you you have at the grassroots community organizing. You know, um, and combine with this demographic change. And so uh, I think that um, this is something that we have learned is just, uh, is the power of the community, but it's only one strategy. There are more strategies and we need like uh, to look, okay, work doesn't work, work doesn't work. Now you, you need to try and let's see. And I'm so happy at the, at the end of the day is that we were able to defeat no, the two, uh, 287G in these two counties that, uh, in, but, but at the same time, this is, we have to give a recognition to our community as also vulnerable, undocumented, many that talk to that or pushing their family members to get out to vote no, or passing the information or uh, when we were canvassing, giving us uh, food or something to drink, no? That requires you know, a complete community. And that's kind of the, the amazing work of all many canvassers and many non-canvassers, family members, and entire families participating in this electoral politics. It's just one strategy. There are more. Uh, I think that we have to use it all and in particular continue you know, to, to be um, very I don't know if it's a word in English, but uh, um, to be constant, no? Like uh, putting pressure in, in, in different points, in different levels, yes. That's amazing. Thank you, Adelina. It's so true, people power and the power of grassroots movements um, and challenging the way we look at policy in general. Um, so thank you for that. Um, moving on to Isha. Isha, you've had an amazing history of leadership, including being the former executive director of Men's Stopping Violence. You've spent years advocating for ending violence against women, fighting for reproductive justice, fighting for immigrant rights, and more. Um, I actually watched your plenary speech uh, for the Civil Liberties and Public Policy Program and was super inspired by it. And it really, really resonated with me. Um, in particular, something you said, you said, violence has an aim. 
to remove power and instill fear. Violence functions to silence those whom it targets. And when I heard that, I thought it was so powerful. It's such a powerful description of violent institutions like ICE, like Border Patrol, like the prison industrial complex. And I thought of the survivors of Irwin who I talked to and who were silenced for so long in fear of retaliation. Um, my question to you is, what were your thoughts when you heard about the immigrant women at Irwin being subjected to invasive gynecological procedures without their consent, um, given the long history of violence against women and in particular, black, brown and indigenous women, were you shocked at the abuses? And lastly, how can we better organize during movement moments like these that galvanize attention to the horrors without dropping our eyes from the bigger picture of long-term strategic change? Um, I thought I was the queen of compound questions, but I think <laughs> it, goes to, it goes to Priyanka. Um, but those are great questions and I'll just kind of take them in order. Um, I can't say I was shocked. Um, any student of US history would find it hard to be shocked given the long history of state sanctioned harm. And in particular, this practice of um, reproductive violence, reproductive coercion and population control is a, is a historical element of US policy. So if we go you know, to its roots, we think about these kind of twin pillars of both colonization and enslavement that hold up the, what's happening today, the contemporary ideology of population control, that there are too many black and brown people and that they should not be here, you know, um, and that those, it's rooted in those. And these are practice, practices of state sanctioned violence. So when I think about the family separation system, either in the form of the quote unquote child welfare system or immigration detention and deportation, those can be traced back to policies of population control um, and the practices of separating families in, during enslavement and the genocide of native peoples. Like these, the, there's a direct historical line to the policies we're seeing today and those of the past. And there are actually, there are many living survivors of state eugenics programs who are working right now for accountability um, and acknowledgement of what, what they face and what they experienced in places like North Carolina. I think there's like over 7,000 people um, that the state sterilized between, I think the early, late 1920s and 1970s, early 1970s. California has a, a long documented practice of sterilizing women incarcerated in their state prisons um, as recently as 2010. And these practices are rooted in history, though they are contemporary human rights violations. And so I would say that the solutions are systemic because the problems are systemic. So for people who are incarcerated, whether that's in jail or prison or immigration detention, access to healthcare has long been a fight. Um, and so providing for basic reproductive and sexual health needs is treated in those spaces as non-essential. Um, and, in, and you know, you in Georgia, there has been a long fight and in many places to um, ban the practice of um, incarcerated people have, uh, having to give birth in shackles separated from their, from their children immediately um, upon giving birth. Um, there's, there's a fight for, um, like Uche mentioned, trans people incarcerated are isolated and also denied access to the healthcare that they need, including hormones. Um, and so, I think the organizing to demand care with dignity is, is a core of this, you know, but that kind of brings up this big important question of how can you demand bodily autonomy inside of a system that's fundamentally designed to deny it. It is about removing bodily autonomy and agency. So almost all of the women that spoke out in the press um, that have experience in Irwin 
um, said that they described Irwin as a concentration camp. Um, they use that language. They talked about experimentation and extermination. They use those words. And they described sexual abuse. They described inadequate medical care, lack of care for people who were pregnant, and then just a lack of basic uh, human rights, like clean drinking water, rampant um, solitary confinement. And uh, like Uche also mentioned, they reported being punished if they spoke out for themselves. So the question that, that what that brings me to is the question of can this kind of institution be reformed? And can anyone inside that space be considered to consent to anything, to consent to any medical care? Because it's hard to imagine that consent is possible under those conditions. So if consent isn't possible, then if it's, if it's impossible, then reform of that system is practically and ethically impossible also. And for me, it's that understanding, that rationale, thinking about this institution, its harms, what it means, how it was designed historically and how that plays out contemporarily that leads me to a politics of abolition for uh, the criminal legal system, right? So that's how I arrived there. So because the only way to offer bodily autonomy to folks is to free them from that space. So, but what that means for our practical goals, like you said, how do we do the work of providing folks uh, access to things like healthcare, which they need while we're advocating for abolition? I think there are, this is part of the you know, policy work that I do and we're doing this, we have to think about, okay, so it's about what we do between now and abolition, right? How do we engage with these systems in a way um, that doesn't move us away from our goal of abolishing them. So anything that puts more money into the detention system, into ICE, into um, uh, these institutions is one that pushes us away from our goal of abolishing them, right? So that's one thing you can look at is where's the money going? Um, anything that puts solutions in, in the hands of the perpetrators. So if ICE is responsible for determining its own um, the problems and its own solutions, then that's a policy change that is not sufficient and remo moves us away from an abolitionist goal. Um, and anything I think that undermines the overall goal of shrinking and to the point of eliminating the carceral state is uh, our goals that take us away from our uh, solutions. So something like making sure that people have access to healthcare is is an example of something that can materially make the lives of people inside better and that does not undermine an abolitionist um, goal. Although how that happens is really important. Where is the money going? And all of those things are policy considerations that those of us that do policy work around criminal legal system reform and have an abolitionist politic have to be really careful about. And the, 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 whole, um, the whole ball game is in the details. Um, like, are we inflating the budgets of these institutions in order to get access to those human rights? Um, and that's a real issue that we have to be particularly careful. Um, and yeah, so I think I answered, I answered your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Isha. And um, we definitely agree that carceral state is about removing bodily autonomy. And so there is no reforming these institutions. It is about abolishing ICE and the carceral state. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, to our audience, we will jump into Q&A in about five minutes. So please go ahead and queue up your questions. Um, in the meantime, I have one last question for our panelists today. Um, and I think all of you already touched on it. But we have some time, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, ask you it anyhow. Um, how do we organize to abolish ICE and other similar repressive institutions? Um, Isha talked about defunding, right? Like we don't wanna keep giving it more money. Um, and so that's one way, uh, Alina, you've talked about Barash's organizing and Uche, you have as well. Um, if you all have any other thoughts around other ways of organizing to abolish ICE, we'd love to hear it. Uh, 
um, our, I guess everybody already talked about this, but I just wanted to add um, how to organize. So Abolish Eyes is through um, constantly sharing our stories, but I think that our stories are very powerful and it is very important in abolishing the systems. Um, by also centering the voices of those that are directly impacted by this system and um, also those with the lived experience. Also by building the leadership of the directly impacted members, um, community members, because at, 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 um, it, it is their stories that are really gonna get us to, um, to the goals. I can remember when I was um, appointed to be on mayor's um, Mayor Bottoms um, commissioned to end um, Atlanta City Detention Centers. I really appreciated that uh, opportunity because it also helped me to really realize the importance of my story. Uh, and that is because I was kind of being given that opportunity. So we also have to really recognize the um, experiences of the LGBTQ immigrants and center them in the leadership and also center them in the conversation because you know these communities are most really most you know they're the ones that most mostly impacted by the uh, by this um, system uh, of course continue to reach out to our elected officials and have continued to have the conversation with them about the uh, and demanding uh, the fund and investing our dollars our taxpayers money into uh into our communities and not you know into Cajun people and continue to also show up for the immigrant communities because that's also one way that we can organize to abolish the system we need more um as more allies and support uh, as possible center black people in leadership um um also especially black lgbtq um immigrants in leadership in every institution Thank you, Ujay. Um, I want to lift up what you said. You said you talked about lifting up the voices of those impacted and your experience on Mayor Bottoms' commission and being, you know, having a seat at the table. That was something that we had to fight for. Um, that was not something readily available. We had to fight to make sure that your voice and other voices of those who were directly detained and harmed by the Atlanta jail had a seat at the table. Um, and thank you for, for sharing that. I, I just want to mention something and I think that um, we should already talk about it, but I just wanted to make sure that um, I do believe that the, the power of our own organizations, but also I think it's important that working coalition um it is important and i do know that there are many different strategies that sometimes conflict each other but i do think that there are organizations willing to take on board a uh, the work uh, and the other is keep organizing keep organizing and keep pushing to be on the table i think that's part of the um than the work that we still have to do as, as our community organizers is that sometimes the work is not recognized to the people that have produced that work. You know? Sometimes it's being recognized other people um, but uh, and left behind many others that are the ones doing the work on the ground. Uh, but I think that, um, I think coalition building is very, very important in, in in particular in these fights for uh, larger institutions, uh, it has to. And looking into have different strategies from different fronts, I think that could help. Um, I always hear, they laugh at me, but um, I always say, okay, let's go slow because I am in a rush, no? So it's like, a, okay, move, keep moving, uh, br uh, building bridges, bridges with others. Um, it, is that coalition work that in many instances um, show the power as well, you know? Um, just just uh, ask to be treated with respect 
you know, and with dignity, dignity as equals inside a coalition. I think that's part of our own things that we have to work on up, out. Um, I just have one thing to add. I and and it's because this case of shutting down Irwin kind of showed the power of movement led. A grassroots anchored communication strategy. And what I mean by that is the media coverage, um, you all supported people who were inside and people who had been recently inside Irwin to speak to journalists. Um, and those, th those voices were really important. Uh, the legal complaint was really important, but also which got you know, a delegation of Congress people to come and tour. And so that was a communication strategy campaign that the coalition undertook in order to surface um, what was going on inside. And I think it was in no small part, a big, part, you know, like a big element of bringing um, the stories forward. Everybody has mentioned the importance of stories. Those stories are only as, as I mean, they're more powerful, the more reach they have. And so all of the coverage, um, of the harm that was happening inside Irwin, I think, can, and this, the strategy that you all used to leverage the media machine for that was really impressive and I think really important and was a pivot point for um, the campaign to shut down Irwin. It was getting so much media attention um, and that I think was vital. And it was, it didn't just accidentally happen. You know, I know it was, uh, there were reports, there were interviews, there was lots of prep that everybody did to make sure that um, detainees voices were the center of that strategy. Um, and I think it's, it's, an, it's something that contributed to the success of the campaign. Absolutely, thank you, Isha. Um, it's one thing to read about it in a report, but when you know we have congressional members literally going inside Irwin and talking to the individuals who are detained, and then coming out and live tweeting or coming out and sharing the video of their reaction was super powerful. Um, so definitely agreed. Um, we have a question in our comment box from Azure, our legal and advocacy director. Um, her question is, can any of the panelists speak to the role of US imperialism and neoliberalism in creating the conditions that force people to flee their homes, as well as the connections between the movement to abolish ICE and the movement to stop U.S. war making. I can start a, a little bit. Maybe the other panelists can help us, can help me. But uh, I do think that we in the U.S. we have a social responsibility in regards the poverty in another countries in Latin America and all, and all over the place is uh, around the globe. I think it's important to recognize the uh, the influence of this uh, this culture over other uh, countries. Uh, in particular, I can talk about the uh, migration from Central America and what is the impact that we are having now. Not a problem at the border, and many many uh, caravans coming, no, or crossing Mexico with a lot of problems with the, with a narco traffic. No, and, um, and also here in the United States, the doors are closed. So I think that it is important for all of us to, to make this reflection, you know, that, that type of uh, uh, how we live and how we have this privilege as well. No, uh, that it recognize that privilege and how we can extend the support to other people that have suffered the consequence of this imperialism. No, in particular in Latin America, um, but because we have seen it, no, is these uh, countries that live in poverty with a, a lot of corruption, uh, a, no jobs, no. Many of those countries are living based on the money that the uh, uh, people here in the United States is sending. So we do have a social responsibility. We are in privilege, no. We are fighting our battles. But I think that we need to recognize what is a, 
and to uh, recognize, but also to make that reflection, no? Why I'm playing, what is my part in this global disaster, disaster uh, about immigrants, no? And how this has impact other countries. Um, I wanted to actually, um, I wanted to add to that. Um, thank you so much for saying that. Um, we, the U.S., have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of roles to fill in terms of protecting immigrant communities because we have a lot of roles that we played in this country, in, you know, in, in most countries that actually cause people to flee. I'm going to speak specifically countries like Af um, um, continent like Africa where the U.S. evangelical, uh, you know, groups go to different uh, African countries to, you know, to fuel hate um, about, uh, you know, hate, hate about uh, the LGBTQ um, communities um, that, you know, like right now there is, um, there is a, a bill that is in, you know, in the parliament in Ghana uh, that, you know, is undergoing discussion and this bill specifically, if it goes into, uh, into law would, you know, criminalize the LGBTQ people in Ghana. And this also, this law or this bill was written by, you know, US evangelical ministry with also Ghanaian, uh, you know, uh, government officials. Same, same bill, you know, that now is the law in Nigeria was also fueled and supported by the US evangelical ministry. So, there's a lot of roles that you know the US uh, you know played in in you know in most of these countries. So when people come here, it, I think that it is our duty to you know protect them because we cost you know we participated in the reason why they're fleeing. So it is our duty and responsibility to you know protect them and help them seek asylum. Also, that is the promise that Lady Liberty you know promised to protect everyone who comes, right? So that protection, like where, where is that protection, right? Where is that promise that Lady Liberty promised us? Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing to add, I think is that if we, um, we have set up a system in which your a person's rights are secured by virtue of their citizenship status that you know nation states give rights to people who they consider their citizens their citizens that's how we get the rights that we have that structure is itself what has created the circumstance of refugees then being in the position to have to say well this this country that I'm, I have citizenship is refusing to protect my rights. And this country is telling me they will, but I don't have citizenship there. And I think the concept of citizenship um, as the way that we are conferred our rights is an imperial one, right? That comes out of a, of a, a, a framework of colonization. And that also, I think it's important to name like the um, way that the late, like the, forces of labor are at play here, right? That we at, give um, labor protections also by virtue of citizenship, which is another way that, um, and sometimes not even then, um, you know, it's like that that's, the, that that's the way, that's where our rights are rooted. That is um, uh, a, like sort of a recipe for disaster, a recipe for persecution. Um, and I think, you know, as of this question about the forces that create the conditions to pe for people to leave their, home, their homes is exactly has to do with economic conditions of creating destabilized, de creating and destabilizing places where there are resources that you know, the sort of Western world wants and then closing borders to those people who are in those destabilized places. It's not, um, it's not unintentional that that's happening. It's part of the cycle. It's like you create this kind of scarcity and hoarding of resources uh, only if you police your borders. And I think the only thing to add to that now is that we're living in a time where policing of borders also includes this very scary biosurveillance that's happening. And that's part of this as well, that it's the borders are everywhere. Thank you all so much. Um, we have a few comments in the chat, but no questions. Um, 
Any more questions? Last call. All right, seeing none, we can, I think, start closing out. This has been such an incredibly powerful and important conversation, um, and we look forward to continuing it in the future. I want to thank our amazing panelists again and want to give you all an opportunity to share how we can support your work and your organization. If people in the audience want to find out more information about your work or your organization, um, feel free to share one more time your organization and where people can find out more information. Um, so I will start with Adelina. Yes, I was uh, starting to write on that chat as well the information, uh, but also a, you can donate to Georgia Latino Alliance for Human Rights, or sometimes if you don't have money, but you have time and you live in Georgia, come to see us. Uh, uh, we have a lot of campaigns, a lot to do. Uh, you can participate as a volunteer with our, our work. But Georgia Latino Alliance for Human Rights, we are in Facebook, um, in Twitter, uh, in Instagram, no? Uh, you can find us. But I will write information on the chat room before you close. Thank you, Annalena. Nisha? Uh, um, so I, I, so I'm at the Center for Advancing Innovative Policy at CAPE, and uh, if you all or if any of you are interested in thinking about policy and grassroots organizing, I would love to talk to you. Um, but I just want to, you know, echo giving your resources to grassroots orgs, and um, this is organizations like GLAR are facing so many, so many things. So. Um, I hope that if folks have extra resources and time that they do that. Thank you so much. And Uche, do you want to share more about your organization? Yes, um, I was just typing on the chat. <laughs> so yeah, you can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram is queer, D-E-P-Q-U-E-E-R-D-E-P. -E -E and our website is qdep.org uh you know you can check us you can follow us mostly on instagram um so you can stay up to date on our uh, work and what we are up to um and if folks uh want to maybe know more or maybe follow me personally my instagram is uche underscore onwa u-c-h-e underscore onwa which is my last name uh please qdep needs your money we need your tax uh your dollars uh, and of course, very soon people will be getting their uh, tax um, back. Please donate part of that to QDEB. Um, the work cannot happen without the, uh, the right fund. We are the only organization in New York City that is specifically providing support to all LGBTQ immigrants coming from everywhere. Uh, different organizations, they're either working for trans community or they're working for Latino or Black but QDEP work with all the LGBTQ community coming from everywhere. So that is very, very unique about us. So we need money to be able to continue doing the work. Um, thank you. Thank you all so much. Again, it's been so powerful and, and kind of an honor of mine to be here with you all. Thank you again. Thank you, Priyanka. That was so lovely and well organized. So thank you for all that work. Of course. Thank you. Thank See you, you so much, Priyanka. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Um, Priyanka. Okay. I was gonna say, do we need to stay by? But I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs>